All right. Good evening, everyone. So we are about to get started in a few minutes. We're just going to wait until 630 to kind of let everyone come in. Um, but in the meantime, uh, feel free to mess around with the chat features um, and just let us know where you're coming in from. If you are coming in from the state, just what region or if you're out of state. All right, so it is 630. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so just to preface this program, um, this is the spring wildlife program. And we do have a couple rules. So just make sure that you are being appropriate in the chat and the Q&A. Um, we cannot see you or hear you. So you don't have to worry about your um, names or your faces being recorded. Um, so don't worry about any of that. But if we do suspect that any inappropriate behaviors going on, um, we will have to disable the chat and possibly remove you from the live stream. So just please uh, make sure to keep all conversations relevant and uh, appropriate. Thank you. And with that, so we're gonna get started. And tonight's program is going to be a little bit about which wildlife is kind of returning to the area. It is springtime. Um, we have lots of migratory animals coming back through the state, uh, lots of animals coming out of hibernation, lots of reptiles coming back up. So this is going to be a pretty interesting guide to what is gonna be around, how to find it, and also how to safely interact with those wildlife species. Um, and if you have any questions, I will put my email up at the end, or you can always reply to the initial um, email with uh, the registration link, and that will lead to my email as well. But joining me is the wonderful Jess Wolf. Uh, she is our urban wildlife coordinator for the Western region. Um, so she is going to help answering any questions or um, you know, hanging out in the chat and chatting with you all. So if you have anything to uh, put in the chat or in the Q&A, she will be helping me out with that. And so before we get started, um, if you are new to Zoom, maybe you haven't used it, or maybe you just need a little refresher, we have a couple features. So on your chat, you should have this little blue bar where it says the two. Uh, so make sure that is changed to attendees and panelists. And then also you should see these icons at the bottom of your screen. So there is the chat button and you can use that to respond to any kind of general questions that I might pose to you um, or just to chat with other uh, viewers. And then we also have the Q&A which is going to be good for any of your own questions um, that you might have for me or Jess. So feel free to use those features. I love when people want to share anything in the chat. It makes it much more interesting and interactive. Um, I don't want you to think that this is just me talking to you. So please feel free to interact and share your experiences as well. Um, and we're also gonna use this icon, this little red chat icon just means that you're encouraged to use the chat to talk about any kind of questions. So we're gonna use that as like a chat storm. All right, so we'll kind of practice that chat feature real quick. We were kind of doing that at the very beginning, but um, so I got to see a little bit about where everybody is from, but what is your level of experience with wildlife viewing and knowledge? So maybe you are a beginner, maybe you have a little bit of experience, maybe you are a seasoned wildlife watcher, but I always love to see you know, what is going on, um, what you have experience with. So feel free to share that in the chat. Maybe you are an at-home wildlife watcher. Uh, maybe you like to go on trips. 
So we have some people saying just like to look around my area, beginner, intermediate. Awesome. So this is going to be great for people of all different um, levels. So if you want to kind of maybe refine your abilities to identify species, or maybe you are kind of just looking for that one lifer bird, um, or maybe you just really just want to know a little bit more about what you're seeing every day. Maybe you keep seeing the same birds or the same um, squirrels or something, and you want to know what that is and how to interact with it properly. So we will definitely be going over that. Cool. So here's what you can get out of today's webinar. So uh, you can impress your friends and family with some hibernation knowledge and which animals do it. So a lot of people don't actually know what is like true hibernation versus torpor and stuff like that. Uh, if you're a birder or if you wanna get into birding, you can create your spring checklist and also know where to find some of these birds. So we are entering the spring migration. Uh, so just make sure that you will be able to kind of interact and check out those birds. And also knowing how to safely and responsibly view the wildlife as well. So we're going to go over a few definitions real quick. So one is an obligate migrator, which is an animal that must migrate every year as part of their life history. So it kind of um, in their biological clock, they will get a sense um, to move forward, to move into a new area. So that is part of their natural life history. We also have facultative migrators. Uh, these are going to be animals that will migrate if resources are scarce. Uh, so they ultimately make the decision on whether or not they want to migrate. And it's kind of up to them based on uh, how they feel about the resources around them. Uh, then we have diurnal, which means active during the day. So nocturnal, this is diurnal. And crepuscular, which means animals that are active in the morning and twilight hours. So we do have some crepuscular animals here. Lastly, there's a couple differences between these two things. So we have torpor, which is an involuntary state of lethargy and lowered heart rate um, during unfavorable lifting conditions. So this could be, for example, when it's really cold out or maybe it's uh, there's not a whole lot of food around, um, something like that. Uh, so this is going to be more of a shortened period of time. It only maybe lasts a day to a couple days. And then we have hibernation. Um, this can range from regular hibernation, which can last maybe like a week or so, or even a couple days to true hibernation, which, which can last actually weeks. Um, and it's an extended period of dormancy or inactivity. Um, and typically it'll occur in the winter. So when we say true hibernators, we're referring to animals that definitely will have a very prolonged state of inactivity. They will be staying in their burrows or their dens for a really long amount of time without waking up or coming out. So uh, there's a difference between the two and we'll kind of go into that a little bit. But we'll kind of break it up real quick with a little another chat time. I already kind of got what uh, region everyone is from, but if you kind of came in late and you still wanna share what region you're from, I'd feel free to uh, put that in the chat as well. Um, I know we had, I didn't even really look at that before. So some people are from South Lake Tahoe. We've got somebody from Florida. That's really awesome. I'm glad to have you here. More people from Reno, California, Carson City, Washington. That's awesome. So I'm glad to see people from all kinds of different areas of the world. Wonderful. All right, so we're gonna kind of go into wildlife viewing ethics real quick. So it is very important before you head out, I know you're eager to get out, the weather was super warm today up here in Northern Nevada, um, but just make sure that you were following some of these uh, kind of unspoken rules of the wildlife community. So it's an important part of all potential interactions with wildlife. So we all share a responsibility for conservation. Um, so whether you want to or not, the responsibility does kind of fall on everybody to make sure that we are doing our part to um, help our species, especially our most vulnerable species. Um, and then always be prepared for the possibility of an interaction, uh, whether you want to interact or not. So um, interactions can come in a lot of different forms. Maybe you're hiking and you have an unexpected bear or cougar interaction or a rattlesnake or something like that. Um, it's better to know what to do than to be afraid. We're not saying you should be afraid. We're saying that you should be prepared to know what to do. 
So that's something that's very important that can uh, save you from making the wrong decision and possibly hurting yourself or an animal um, or other wildlife or other people. And wildlife viewing ethics, of course, circles back to people and communities as well. So um, one thing is respecting other wildlifers uh, by sharing your observations. If you see that somebody is maybe incorrectly, you know, interacting with wildlife or just maybe using really bad habits when they go out. So maybe you see people feeding wildlife and, you know, you don't want them to do that. Uh, using positive correction to educate them. Instead of yelling at them, say like, hey, here's why we don't want you to do that. And maybe here's a better alternative. Um, also not interfering with the viewing experience. Um, if you see a group of birders quietly, you know, looking through their binoculars, watching something, uh, don't be rude and make a bunch of noise and possibly scare away that um, bird that they might be watching. So just be aware and be respectful of what's going on around you. Also uh, respect private property and the rights of others. So um, make sure not to enter people's property. Um, if you really want to, I would suggest maybe asking them before you just barge onto somebody's property or um, looking through their, you know, it's really weird if you were to look outside and see people looking into a tree in your front yard, but you don't know that when you have a bunch of binoculars staring through your front window. So just be appropriate and understand that you are interacting with other people. And then also understand that everyone has the right to access the same areas as you do. Uh, do not participate in gatekeeping, which is kind of like uh, something that has become more of a problem. Uh, a lot of people have been moving into Nevada, and I understand that if you're like a native person, you maybe will be like upset with more people moving into the areas that you've loved to view wildlife. Maybe they're becoming a little bit more busy, but they do have every right to be there as much as you do. Um, as long as they're being responsible and ethical about what they're doing, as long as they're cleaning up after themselves. And that kind of goes back to that positive correction to uh, educate other people if you think that they're using the space inappropriately. But at the end of the day, everybody has a right to be there just as much as you do. And then of course, habitats and wildlife are relevant. Um, our habitats can be incredibly fragile and you can cause irreversible harm. So it's just important to be cautious. So number one, Always just respect the laws. We have Migratory Bird Treaty Act and also the Endangered Species Act, uh, which are two key protection laws across the um, United States to know. Um, so that will protect you from, uh, protect our birds from taking any of their feathers or any parts of them or inappropriately moving or selling them, anything like that. But also know your state's laws and the laws of the park or refuge or property that you might be visiting because it can change across the board. I know I work at a park where dogs are not allowed and people are really shocked to hear that sometimes, but we work in a nature study area. So it's important that people know that um, as much as we love our furry friends, they should just stay home when it comes to this nature study area or just go to a different park where maybe those um, habitats aren't as sensitive. Another big thing is to not touch sick or injured wildlife. So that's super important. Um, instead, uh, if it really is still bothering you, you can call an entity, like you can call Endow. Uh, we do have Jess, she's our urban wildlife coordinator. So she can handle some situations uh, where we have maybe injured wildlife, um, or you can alert a ranger if you're in a park or something like that. Uh, you can stay on the trails and make sure you're keeping your dogs on a leash and clean up after yourself. That's just a big uh, rule of thumb. Okay, so now we kind of established our ethics, so we are going to get into it. So we have a couple different types of migration that we'll talk about that is kind of relating to our spring wildlife and what's going on. So we have north-south migration, which is the migration to warmer climates, and that's going to be during the winter time. But then during the summer, a lot of those animals that move to the warmer climates will move back up north. So currently, our animals are going to be moving from the southern regions back up to the northern regions. So this could be, um, it depends. It's not always going to be the same area. For some species, uh, warmer might be southern Canada, but for some species that's not warm enough, so they got to go all the way to South America. So it just depends. Um, but they are currently moving back up north. So they are moving in this direction. Then we have elevational migration. So it'll be movement to lower elevation in the winter months. So to escape that snowpack, um, they're following a food source um, and just trying to stay in a place where it's a little bit warmer. And they're gonna be returning back up uh, to the higher elevations in the summertime um, because there'll be more food availability. And also when those animals come back from migrating south, it'll also be a lot busier and a lot more populated. So they kind of wanna get away from that. 
So our elevational migrators will be going back up. All right, so we will break up the chat again now that we've kind of talked a little bit about our um, some of our things. But before we get into our actual animals that we might see, does anybody want to share like a specific springtime animal that they love or, um, you know, maybe something that you've just been dying to see that has been gone all winter and you cannot wait to see it again. Um, I know for me, one of my things is I really love seeing some of the birds that are around my house so some of the ducks uh, that come up um, and they're not usually here during the winter. So we got our redhead ducks, um, some of our ring neck ducks and all these other things. So there are a couple ones that I am really excited to see again. White pelicans, yes, I love pelicans. I just saw, we went to Pyramid Lake and I saw them recently, so they're coming back. Then we got our meadowlark. Yes, meadowlarks are super fun. For gansers. Yes, I love hearing the frogs as well. They've been super loud around me. Oh yes, and the osprey. Yeah, just said the osprey, that's my favorite as well. Okay, awesome. So I love to hear about everyone's favorite springtime animals. It's fun. All right. So we're going to get into some mammals. Um, these are mostly just animals that are coming out of hibernation or moving elevationally, um, even some that are migrating across the state. Uh, so some mammals don't hibernate, hibernate or change any of their activity patterns significantly, but there are some that migrated, hibernated, or have been really inactive during those months. So we're going to start looking at what we're going to see again and kind of how to interact with them. So the big one is our black bears. Um, if you live in the northern part of the state or the western part of the state, uh, you might be seeing black bears a lot more. They are going to be bordering in this dark gray area. So um, kind of like right here. So we don't really get them throughout the entire state, but definitely in the northern region we get them um, and maybe sometimes even bordering in the southern region too but not to be confused with grizzlies or polar bears or anything like that. Grizzlies are gonna be way up here. So we do not get grizzlies in the state. Um, the only states that really get grizzly bears are like Montana and like Washington, maybe sometimes Idaho um, and Alaska, obviously. But we do not have to worry about polar bears or grizzly bears. But our black bears are pretty cool. Um, they go through periods of torpor during the winter. And during this time, they can lower their body temperature about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so this kind of is a lowering of the body temperature, so they do not have to maintain as much energy. Um, they're going to be lowering the respiration rate, um, and they have very little intake of food for long periods of time. Uh, so this is why during the fall, you might see them uh, fattening up, and it's called hyperphagia. So they're going to be basically finding as much food as possible. They can gain up to 30 pounds a week during this time, so they are fattening up a ton but they're gonna emerge from their torpor occasionally. So it's not unusual to see a bear during the winter time or even early in spring. So if you do see a bear right now, uh, don't be alarmed, they're coming out and it's gonna be a new thing. So um, they might do that to take advantage of good conditions. So if it's really warm out or if there's like good snow melt, so there's good water runoff or something like that, uh, they might do it to react to disturbance. So this is why, um, you know, not good to go looking for bear dens or anything like that because you don't want to disturb them. And also with our females to give birth. And um, so additionally, our females might be emerging from their dens with little ones that were not there before. And it's kind of funny because they might even give birth and not even realize it. Um, that's how into torpor they can get. Uh, they might be asleep completely. But during this time, they are using a lot of that stored energy to feed their young ones. So when they do emerge from the den, just be aware that uh, they are going to be looking around. Yes, so during the springtime, they're going to be looking for easy food sources. Um, so unfortunately, this might mean some of your trash cans. So if you do live in a bear prone area, just make sure that you are following uh, regulations with storing your food and everything like that. And it's to keep you safe and also to keep our bears safe because the last thing you want is for your bears to get into something that's really dangerous and harmful to them. Uh, they can eat anything, even if it's pretty bad for them. Like they've been known to eat like motor oil or like antifreeze and stuff like that. So uh, just make sure that you are properly storing any of your smelly items. And they've also lost a pretty significant amount of their body fat, up to 30% of their body weight. 
which will need to be gained back. Um, so this is going to be a time where they're fervently eating to try to regain that strength. Um, so in the fall and the spring, they definitely do try to fatten up a lot. But also be cautious when hiking during this time. Like I said, they have their cubs with them. So make sure you give them good distance um, and also clean up after yourself so you're not attracting them to the area. And this is applicable if you're going camping this spring or going hiking or anything like that. All right, so this is one of my favorite animals um, in terms of the mammals. This is our yellow-bellied marmot. And our yellow-bellied marmot occurs across the state, maybe not so much in the southern region, but definitely in the center and the western region of the state. And this is what they look like. They've got bushy tails, they're pretty fat, they're a lot bigger than a squirrel. So if you see these um, kind of yellowish gray looking uh, rodents, this is what they are. And they're gonna be the largest true hibernators. And when we say uh, true hibernators, they're actually completely inactive for 60 to 80% of the year. And they're gonna be staying in their burrows. So during this time, they're going to be waking up very little. They're going to be pretty much lowering their respiratory rate and their body temperature significantly to make it through the winter and through conditions where there may not be grasses or flowers or anything like that for them to eat. Um, but like I said, you can find them foraging for grasses and flowers during the day in late spring to early fall. And they should be kind of coming out right around now. Um, they hibernate from roughly September to April. So some of them might even be, you know, out and about in the lower elevations right now. Um, maybe not so much in the higher elevations, but I have been seeing them out and about now. And they are just so adorable and so fat and cute. And they're one of my favorite ones. So uh, kind of keep an eye out for them. Um, they do these little alarm calls too, which are pretty interesting. Then we're also going to get a ton of ground squirrels. So you're going to start seeing those ground squirrels out again. Um, maybe you haven't really seen the ground squirrels. Uh, you might see some gray squirrels with the bushy tails. Um, but our ground squirrels have been mostly kind of staying under the radar for the last few months. So now they're going to be kind of hanging out. And Nevada is home to eight species of ground squirrel, which are pretty widespread across the state. Um, there are quite a few of them in the southern region, in the northern region, we don't really get as many. Um, but they're going to be spending a majority of their life underground and coming up to forage. Um, so they have a number of reasons why they stay underground. They're going to have their colonies down there, they sleep, they eat, they have their young down there. Um, so they will come up and you'll see them when they get scared, they run underground. And they're actually very social. So they live in colonies. Uh, you can expect to see them kind of in this like scrub habitat. So if you live um, in the high desert or sagebrush habitats, uh, they love to hang out around these like creosote bush scrub habitats, um, rocky habitats. This is where you might see them. Um, they also might be in wooded areas with like a lot of fallen trees and debris so that they have area to kind of like go under. Uh, but this is where you might see a lot of them. And uh, one thing about the ground squirrels is like, it's really tempting to feed them because they will come right up to you and look like they just have the cutest, biggest eyes and they want to be fed. But please, you know, try to um, not do that just because they need to be able to cache and find food on their own. We have a couple of mice too, which are pretty, uh, you know, elusive. But if you do see them, these are going to be more of our desert animals. So we've got our Western jumping mouse. And they're only active three months out of the year. So it's kind of cool to see them because um, they are so rare to find. Um, but they can be found close to streams and desert areas. So riparian habitats, um, even in the high desert or sagebrush scrub. Uh, they're mostly gonna be found in Northern Nevada and they will hop around and leap longer distances when startled. So you might see, they kind of look, will maybe initially be confused for a kangaroo rat but they're going to be hopping around and jumping and stuff like that. So those are pretty cool to see this time of year. Another one is the pocket mouse. They look kind of weird. Um, it looks like somebody put a face and didn't give them a body. Um, so they're very interesting looking, but they're extremely solitary and they have a home range of less than one acre. So they won't really venture too far from their home burrow. They're gonna be inactive most of the year, but they're gonna start to come out right around now. And they can also be found all over the state, uh, mostly preferring, like I said, that dry scrub sagebrush um, areas and the desert scrub areas. And they're gonna be a rare, but pretty cool sighting. So um, if you're camping, uh, make sure you keep an eye out for them, if, especially if you're going into those high desert habitats um, or anything like that across the state. 
Okay, now we're going to get into bats a little bit. I know this is a species that doesn't come out as much till summer, but we'll still talk about them a little bit since we are kind of getting that warm weather now. So Nevada is home to 23 species of bats. Um, we've got Mexican free-tail bats, pallid bats, uh, little brown bats, myotis. Um, there's a couple of different ones that I can go on about, but there's too many, it's 23. So um, the whole thing with our bats is that our females have this very cool feature where they can delay all three stages of their reproduction. So they might actually go into the southern areas, or maybe they might stay up here as well. While they're hibernating, they will have a mating. Um, they will do their mating, and then they will come back up here, or if they're hibernating, they will stay here. Uh, they will return to the Nevada area, and they can actually delay the implantation of a fertilized egg. They can delay fertilization of the egg, and they can also delay um, the birth of their child. So um, they don't have to uh, have everything right as everything's happening, which is pretty cool. They can wait till conditions are just right to be able to have their pups. Uh, but our female species are pretty much the only ones that are gonna be migrating back up here. Um, they will have their pups up here. And then once the pups are old enough to fly back, they will return. And bats can be seen pouring out of a lot of different areas like caves, overhanging cliffs, uh, large abandoned structures or bridges. Um, I know we have a pretty cool one up in Reno at the McCarran Bridge. And during the summertime, you can actually see them come out right around sunset. So it's pretty cool to be able to partake in um, this kind of wildlife watching because it's a pretty magnificent and beautiful thing to watch. But um, like I said, some bat species will migrate, uh, some will hibernate and some will do both. So some will stay here um, and you know, just might hibernate through the uh, winter and some will go south, still hibernate and then come back. So it just kind of depends. And with bats, you wanna make sure that you're also viewing them cautiously. It can be really dangerous uh, for them. Uh, so if you disturb their roost sites, um, it can disrupt their hibernation. Even now it's still a little early to be trying to look for them. So try to make sure until weather is consistently above like about 60 degrees every day, um, that's gonna be right around the time that they start coming out. Uh, so late spring, early summer is when we're gonna start seeing them come out. And then lastly, we're going to cover our elevational migrators. So we have our elk, our mule deer, and our bighorn sheep. So those are bighorn sheep. We have a ram and a ewe, and then our elk, which we're going to have our doe and buck. And the way to tell the difference is that um, elk are significantly bigger, and they're going to have more of a like curve on their antlers. Uh, but they're only found in one area in Nevada, which is going to be the uh, Northeast region. So you probably won't see them in the Southern part of the state. And then we've got our mule deer, which are found all over, same with our bighorn sheep. So they're currently migrating to their summer ranges, which are going to be in higher elevation. And their fawning is going to be done in those summer ranges as well. And during this time, females are gonna be highly aggressive. They're gonna be extremely protective of their young. Um, and also the males will be too uh, of their territories. So it's good to be aware of this. Uh, try not to startle or, you know, uh, I guess, surprise any females with their young. There's a good chance that they might run away. Uh, so they're scentless and spotted to protect them from predators. So when they run away, it's more to distract them. They're not like leaving their baby for dead. Um, so don't think that because the mother runs away that it's suddenly abandoned. Um, they do this on purpose to try to distract a predator uh, to chase them instead of their young. So don't worry about our um, baby, uh, our little babies, uh, they'll be okay. Uh, they blend into their environment really well. And like I said, they're scentless. So it's hard for predators to pick up on them. Um, another thing that's pretty interesting is that during this time, uh, so our males, uh, our mule deer and our elk, they will drop their antlers in uh, like roughly early January, late December. So they're still growing those antlers back. So you might see that they're not as big. Um, they're going to be the biggest in late summer. So a lot of people ask me that question. They're like, well, when do they get these huge horns um, or antlers? And it's going to be uh, in the late summer. So right now they're still not really having these impressive antlers or anything like that. Okay, so we're gonna move on to birds and this is my favorite, but I'm gonna check if there's any other questions or anything in the chat. Someone said, are there any moose in Nevada? So 
Technically, no, but we have had sightings of moose in the very, very northern parts of the state. Um, some of them are kind of just passing through, but we don't have any significant populations that come through the state. Um, it would just kind of be pa uh, passing by migrant um, moose. So we haven't really had any ones that we can really like consider technically our Nevada moose, but that's a great question. Um, just is that correct? We don't really have um, any like significant moose populations here. Yeah, I think we might have, if I remember correctly, like 30 or 40 kind of hanging out in the area, but um, definitely not as robust of a population as like our bighorn sheep or our mule deer or elk or anything like that. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if that changes in the future, but right now there's really not a significant number. Yeah, and who knows with like climate change as well, that has a significant effect on some of the way that our populations are, I guess, moving through the area, um, also human impact. So that could change in time, but we don't know for sure. So um, like I said, they're not a significant population, but that's a great question. I get that question sometimes. Okay, so with our birds, uh, we are in the center of two major flyways. So we have the Pacific Flyway. We got a lot of birds moving through the Pacific Flyway and also kind of over from, um, they will kind of come down this way and then they will go over the Rockies or over this way. We even sometimes get birds from the Central Flyway. Um, it's not as common, but we do get some. So we are kind of right in the middle of these two. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some priority birds. So these are gonna be birds of significant conservation need. They are birds that can be managed by multiple agencies because they cross maybe multiple states. So it provides a good opportunity for um, partner support with each other um, to work together for this. And maybe they have, um, when we say priority, it means that they have a conservation need that we believe is able to be fixed. So. Uh, they have a very good chance of being able to be um, rehabilitated in terms of their populations and for the problem to be fixed. So this is kind of just a, a category that I wanted to put them in. So one of, the, one of them is the black-necked black stilt. And this one's going to be mostly breeding in the northern region, but you might see it migrating through in the southern region. And it usually prefers this wetland habitat, but they're super adorable. Um, they've got these long pink legs to, uh, and that's what you can look for when you're looking for them. So wetlands is a good place to find them. I actually think you could probably find them up here right now. Uh, we also have our long-billed curlew, which is going to be another kind of shorebird slash wader bird. Um, and these ones are gonna be found in the Northern part of the state where they breed, but they also are migrating through in the Southern region. Uh, so I know in the southern region, I've definitely seen sightings for these guys in like the Clark County wetlands and Ash Meadows, um, some of those areas, maybe even Moapa, uh, you might be seeing them down there as well, but they prefer a wetland habitat. Another one of my favorites is the redhead duck. Uh, so they are going to be breeding in that orange area on the map. So um, almost all of Nevada, and there's just a little tip at the very bottom, which is kind of rough, um, you know, it's just a guesstimate of where their populations are, but that's where they are usually hanging out um, all year long. So maybe if you live in the Las Vegas area, you will probably see them pretty often, but it's exciting for us Northerners because it's coming back up um, through the state. So they'll be hanging out in the ponds before you know it. Then we also have our Sandhill Crane, uh, which is a beautiful large bird um, that's super exciting to see. Uh, they're going to be breeding and migrating through Nevada. So um, you can see that they migrate through most of the northern part of the state. They kind of do that weird central flyway thing where they come through the center and then they kind of go up and over. So unfortunately, they do kind of miss the southern region, although there might be some that end up there. But they're going to mostly be hanging out in the corners of the state and kind of just migrating through. So you might see them in some marshes or wetlands uh, just to keep an eye out for them right uh, right around now is a good time that you might start seeing them. Uh, then another one of my favorites is the Swains and Talk. Um, the reason why the Swains and Talk is so cool is because it breeds in Nevada, but it migrates all the way from Argentina. So they are kind of considered one of those long range migrators, uh, one of the longest migrators in the bird world. Um, 
but they are going to be breeding around the state or migrating through. Um, so it's definitely going to be super cool to see them. And the thing about these Swainson's hawks is that in some situations they can show up in the hundreds. So they might be in populations of hundreds stopping on their migration route, which is a very cool sight to see. Um, I know that in Ash Meadows and even in the Red Rock area, you could maybe find them uh, migrating through in the hundreds. And then another one is our tricolored blackbird. Um, so this one's easily confused with the red winged blackbird, but the difference is it's got this white patch instead of a yellow patch. Um, but it is a very uh, important population that has been struggling and we're trying to bring it back, but it only really breeds in the Washoe or Douglas counties. Um, so we don't know if it really migrates through the rest of the state, but it just has one small breeding colony up here. So um, that's pretty cool to look out for if you live in that area. And then we're gonna go over some feeder birds. So if you do have your feeders out, um, these are ones that you might start seeing at your feeders. Um, coming back around. So one is a fox sparrow. Um, we have lots of different sparrows that come through, um, but this one's one that's kind of been around, uh, hasn't been around as much. Uh, it's going to be breeding in the northern region um, and kind of in the southern region as well. The savannah sparrow, which is normally a resident in the southern region, but is coming back up to the northern region to breed as well. And then the hermit thrush, which is going to have that speckled coloration and they're going to be breeding across the state. So that's pretty cool um, that they're coming back up here. We also have some hummingbirds. So hummingbirds are super exciting. Um, and these are all going to be native ones. So we have our broad tailed um, hummingbird, which is going to be breeding in the state. Then we have our rufous hummingbird, which is going to be migrating through the state. And they have what we call an orgy rufousy color. So rufous is a birding made up color. Um, it's like an orange rusty color. So they have a rufous patch under their um, mouth on their neck. And then the calliope hummingbird, which is going to be a migrant through the Southern region and then breeding in different parts of the state. And like I said, these are all native hummingbirds that you can start seeing at your feeders. A couple more feeder birds. Uh, so we've got our willow flycatcher, our olive-sided flycatcher, and both of these um, are going to be seen throughout the state. And then our Virginia's warbler, which is going to be breeding in the southern region. So um, willow-sided and olive-sided flycatchers are weird because they look very similar, but the big difference between them is this one's more brown and this one's more green. So, um, but they're still pretty cool. And um, they're kind of more rare birds to see. So if you do see them, that's super exciting. And here's some other birds that you can see this spring. So we've got the flammulated owl um, and they're gonna have small scatter populations across the state. Uh, and they're a very cool owl. Um, I've never seen one, but they're on my list. So I'm hoping to maybe see one this year. Our common loon. Uh, which is beautiful, by the way. I love its uh, speckled plumage. And it spends April and May migrating through the state. So you can definitely try to check out some ponds to see it there as well. The Lewis's woodpecker, which is going to be uh, pretty common in the Southern region, but it's going to be migrating up to central Nevada to breed um, and it breeds in the North. And lastly, uh, the red-necked farlope too. So that's going to be, or phalarope, I always mess that one up. Um, it migrates through the state and it's going to be stopping mostly at wetlands, um, but they're another really beautiful um, shorebird to kind of check out. And then we've also got our sage thrasher. Um, these guys are very cool and they have very interesting behavior, but they're going to be kind of hanging out most of the state um, using the scrub sage habitat. Uh, so I love that scrub habitat where you get like kind of that creosote bush or a sagebrush. We've got our white-faced ibis, which is going to be hanging out in wetlands and it breeds in the marshes on the west and east end of the state, but it's going to be migrating through the middle corridor. So um, it kind of will migrate through and then fan out, which is pretty cool and also another rare sighting to see. And then another really fun one is the burrowing owls. Um, they are found in uh, breeding colonies across like the sagebrush areas in the state but they burrow on the ground and they're one of the few, I think one of the only diurnal owls, they're mostly completely diurnal. Um, and they kind of hang out in these little colonies and groups, which are super fun. 
Uh, and then our ferruginous hawk, which is going to be breeding in the northern region and open grasslands. So if you're looking for the ferruginous hawk, it often gets confused with a red tail. Uh, it's just good to look for that super bright breast color, um, and it usually doesn't have a belly band or the red tails, so, but they are pretty often confused, so just be pretty aware of that um, when you're looking for them. Um, last slide, I promise. Um, okay, so black terns, which are the, uh, they're going to be a migrator through Nevada, um, and they have breeding grounds in the north, so um, they really love to hang out in places like Pyramid, um, and some of our other, like the Humboldt, um, that area up there. We have our Avocet. They are going to be migrating up to breed in the northwest corner of Nevada, but I generally see them even after the breeding season. So they're pretty widespread. Um, our American white pelican, which somebody had mentioned that they were super excited to see again. Um, yes, definitely. They migrate through. Uh, but they have a handful of breeding colonies. So uh, if you live in Northern Nevada, Pyramid Lake is the best place to go and see them. Um, they're already up there right now. So you can go up and check them out, but they're pretty hard to miss, they're huge. And then lastly, the snow goose, uh, which I've also been seeing a lot more recently, but they will uh, leave their Southern winter grounds and migrate way up North for breeding. So they're migrating through the state uh, they actually go all the way up to the Arctic Circle to breed. So it's pretty crazy how far their journey is as well. Okay, let me just check and see if there's any other comments or anything like that. Uh, I just answered a question, but if you have more um, input, uh, we had the question, what are the physical differences between the fox sparrow and the common house sparrow? So for the house sparrows, they have those stripes with uh, buff black and brown on their back and the fox sparrow is more splotched on their flanks and the center of their chests. Do you have any other big differences? No, that's, that's pretty accurate. Um, also, it's a good idea to, um, one of my favorite things to download is the Merlin ID app. Um, it's great because you can test out the songs against each other. So they're going to have pretty vastly different sounds. Um, so it's important to kind of check those out and kind of see what, um, what the sound is for each one and what the song is, because there's going to be pretty significant differences between them. So yeah, songs are always great to check out. Um, okay, cool. So... Now we'll kind of get into some of the reptiles. So our reptiles uh, do what we call um, a kind of reptile-based hibernation called brumation. So during the winter time, they're actually brumating, which means that they are in a lowered state of um, respiration and body temperature. Uh, they're basically trying to survive that cold temperature since they are cold blooded, they lower their need for certain, um, I guess, respiratory needs. So they're gonna be out during the warmest parts of the day once temperatures are consistently warm. So when you start seeing temperatures get about above 65 degrees or higher, they're going to start kind of hanging out in the warmest part of the day. So midday, late afternoon, um, they'll be out. And they will be basking on rocks and hanging out, um, trying to get their body temperature up. But as the summer kind of comes on and it gets really hot, you might see that switch up. So they're going to be starting to get out during the morning and the evening, that crepuscular activity that we talked about before. Um, so they're going to be switching up to early mornings and the late afternoons. Uh, so when it gets really hot, if you're going to go out like herping, which is what we call it, if you're looking for, you know, um, any kind of... Uh, herps, which is what our reptiles are. Um, you can go out in the early mornings or the evenings. Uh, that's usually the best time to find them. Uh, so this is uh, different kinds of lizards and snakes uh, basking in the sun. We also have, uh, you know, Gila monsters and chihuahuas and a lot of other different uh, cool reptiles throughout the state. We do have rattlers in the state. So it's important to know where these are and what to do if you do see a rattler. So Nevada is home to six rattlesnakes. Uh, we have the Mojave Green, which is gonna be in the Southern region. And the Mojave Green is probably the most uh, potent in terms of venom of all of these, probably the most dangerous. Then we have the Western Diamondback, which is the largest, and that's going to be in the Southern region. 
Uh, we have two subspecies of speckled rattlesnake, which is going to be mostly in the central and southern regions. Uh, the great basin rattlesnake, which is going to be statewide, and also the sidewinder, which is going to be in the southern region. And this is a picture of a sidewinder. But all of the rattlesnakes share these features. They have kind of a diamond or um, a spade shaped head. So uh, kind of these triangle shapes. Um, and they're also going to have a rattle but that's the best way to identify them. So with safety around these guys, uh, just if you hear a rattle, just know that the snake is warning you about its presence. It's not gonna bite you right then and there, but it's a good uh, time to stop and look around. If you do hear that rattle, um, be aware of where that snake is, try to find it so that you know that you're not gonna step on it or anything like that. Uh, and if you are bitten, it does happen. Uh, don't panic. Uh, best to do is to kind of figure out the species if you can. Uh, that's going to help with any kind of antivenom um, and go to the hospital. Even if you feel okay, it's better to be checked out um, just to make sure everything's good. Uh, there's a couple myths surrounding rattlesnakes too. Uh, do not try to suck out the wound or tourniquet it. Um, so those are going to make things worse. It's actually proven that it doesn't do anything, just makes it worse. So don't do that. Um, instead, you should put ice on it and elevate the spot um, below heart level. So um, always check your campsite for any kind of snakes and also be careful when placing your hands or feet on rocks or any cliff faces or anything like that. So whenever I go camping in those areas where I know that there's going to be rattlesnakes, I kind of take a flashlight and look around my campsite before I do anything uh, just to make sure I don't find any snake holes or anything, um, any snakes that might be kind of just hanging out. Um, if you do have animals with you, keep them in sight. Uh, try to prevent any interactions. Don't let your dogs just run off and try to look for snake holes because they will get bitten and that's not, uh, they don't fare as well as us in terms of the fatality of rattlesnake bites. So definitely make sure to keep them in sight and maybe on leash. And lastly, just make sure you tell others where you're going. This is a pretty good uh, rule to have just across the board. Uh, you should always tell other people if you're gonna go on a hike and when you're gonna return, um, especially if you're going alone or only with like one other person so that if anything happens to you or your group, then they know where you're at. And we do have a couple of pretty interesting, unique Nevada residents in terms of reptiles. So um, these are kind of like lifetime reptiles that most people don't always see, but if you do get to see them, they're gonna be out this spring. So one, to, one is our banded Gila monster and they are extremely elusive. So they hide a lot, but you can find them between rocks. Um, they're going to be in the Southern region and the uh, really hot areas, usually west of the Mojave Desert or east of the Mojave Desert. Um, they do have a venomous bite, but um, they're really slow moving. So you, uh, if you can see them and have a good warning, they won't bite you. We also have our desert tortoise, which is our state reptile. And they are slow moving, but they're really great at hide and seek. Uh, even as big as they are, sometimes they can be really hard to find, but they really enjoy uh, washes and areas where um, there's lots of like silty sand, good for them to dig out um, to make a burrow. So that's where you might find them. And then lastly, we have our desert horn lizard. We have two different subspecies in the state, one in the north and one in the south, uh, pretty much split directly down the state. So um, right where the southern region starts and right where the northern region starts, there's two different subspecies. And uh, they're gonna have these horns are also called a horny toad which isn't actually like their real name um, or anything like that. I don't know how they got that name. They're not a toad, um, but they do have those scales um, and those spikes on their head. Um, and they're pretty cool once you see them. Uh, they don't really bite, they're pretty gentle actually. Uh, so going back to our um, ethics and stuff, now that we're kind of wrapping things up, we're just gonna kind of recap on the respecting young wildlife aspect. So especially during the springtime, there's gonna be a ton of young wildlife out and it's really tempting to want to get close to them, to take pictures with them, to, um, I guess, care for them if you feel like they might be in need of care. But um, there's a good chance that a parent is nearby, even if they seem in distress uh, or they're testing their boundaries. So this means that, especially with like our baby birds, 
um, a lot of our other babies that they are going to be um, in good hands. They're just being tested or they're being taught to go out on their own little by little um, until they are comfortable leaving their home range or their home territory. So please try to um, not create a situation where these wildlife would be hard to rehabilitate and return to the wild. However, if you're still concerned about things, like I said, uh, you can always call us for advice or, um, you know, it doesn't hurt to call if you're still really concerned. We'd rather have you call than, um, I guess, uh, try to interact with them and create a situation where they could get hurt or you could get hurt yourself. We don't want you to get hurt from an interaction with wildlife either. And just to drive the point home, I'm gonna test you all. So I want everyone to put in the chat, what should you do if you see young wildlife? Um, hope you're paying attention to that last slide. Yes, yeah, somebody said snakes like to warm up on asphalt pavement, so watch out while driving. Yeah, so always check under your car as well um, for those snakes uh, so that you don't get your ankles nipped out or anything like that, uh, especially during those hot days. Yeah, definitely leave them be, watch, but don't approach. Um, you know, don't disturb them. Um, their parents are the best parents. I know it's really tempting. You want to take on a caretaker role with these like really cute young wildlife, but just please try to let them be. Um, don't approach them, admire from a distance. Awesome, everyone passed, good job. All right. And so lastly, just some wildlife watching tips for anybody who is a beginner and wondering kind of where to start. So one big thing I tell everybody is to invest in a field guide or to download some sort of app. So we have a couple different apps. We have Merlin Bird ID, which is great. You can actually go through a five-step process to ID a bird. So they'll ask you like the size and shape of the bird or will the size of the bird, the location, the time of year, the colors, um, and this behavior. So what it's doing. Um, so that can kind of narrow down your search for you. Um, and that's awesome. I recommend everybody get that app because it's super fun to even just try to test your knowledge with birds. Um, also just getting a physical field guide can be fun because um, it's fun to thumb through the pages and see what's in your region. Um, also field guides offer a lot of different information, um, not only just how the animal looks, but also uh, different identification, life history facts about them and all these other things. Uh, practice stop, look, and listen. So if you are out, uh, it's good to just kind of find a shady bench, chill out, try to put your phone down and just imat, like immerse yourself in the situation. Uh, you know, listen around you to what's going on um, and try to detect different evidence of animals. So tracks, scat, maybe like broken areas where there's like a burrow or something like that. Uh, that's a good way to find our wildlife. And then lastly, uh, it's good to talk to others about your observations. So if you have questions, uh, you know, good to find a group or something that you can be a part of. There are lots of wildlife watching groups on like Facebook or just um, like Audubon Society that has memberships and stuff like that, uh, which is always really fun to just kind of get with other people who maybe have experiences. Uh, it's, it's kind of like when you travel, you wanna learn from the locals. They're gonna tell you what all the good stuff is. So talking to other people who are local, maybe have gone wildlife watching in the area is always really great to um, interact with them and kind of get more advice on how to find different things. But with that, um, are there any additional questions? Yeah, so we had one pop up in the chat and um, everyone here just throw in any questions that you might have. We'll answer them to the best of our ability. Um, but the question is, are there many arachnids in Nevada? So actually, yeah, there are uh, quite a few. So we do get desert tarantulas. That's probably our biggest um, arachnid. Um, they are going to be mostly in the southern part of the state um, and they have burrows that they come out of at nighttime. They're mostly gonna be a nocturnal one. Um, we get wolf spiders, we get, um, we get lots of like black widows. We get um, a couple different types of spiders. Um, not really off the top of my head can I name too many, but we do get quite a few. Um, the other thing though, is that Nevada is pretty interesting because it's kind of a um, barren area for a lot of insects in terms of uh, the traditional insects. Like we don't get a lot of parasites here. We don't get a lot of um, really big poisonous animal or uh, arachnids or insects here as well. 
Um, so it is kind of like a desert for them, but we still do get plenty of them. Um, I would recommend if you uh, kind of get a, like a field guide that covers insects, they'll definitely cover um, all the ones and where they are. And also what kind of webs that they weave. Uh, the ones that I had back here, this uh, Sierra Nevada field guide, if you live um, around the Sierra Nevada, uh, this one has a lot of really good um, arachnids in there as well, but I'm sure if you get like a, a state field guide as well. I am also a fangirl of that uh, field guide. It's the perfect size to throw in your pack. So definitely get it if you're in this area. Um, we did have another question. What other groups in the Carson City or Reno area um, are there to join? Oh, okay. So um, we have a couple different groups. So um, you can join like very informal groups. Like if you go on Facebook and look up certain groups, you can be a part of those um, wildlife watching groups. We have the Audubon Society. Um, let's see, I know the university has some groups that they have like that go out and uh, do some different viewing um, and whatnot. I don't know, do you have any other good suggestions, Jess? Um, there's a lot of like Facebook groups. There's also, um, I know if you're a woman, there's women who explore and there's a, uh, Reno Tahoe area group for that um, and it's just basically a bunch of women who go out and go hiking um, sometimes they do trips I know for the like national level they'll do like trips to Patagonia or other places as well so that one's a pretty cool one um, but definitely like Facebook is kind of your best friend there's a lot of groups on there uh, but yeah. Audubon's are a great place to start um, I think yeah, I'm a part of a couple groups on Facebook and it's kind of nice. Uh, they give some good observation tips and just like a lot of people like to post their observations and where they found them or um, just that they're going places and they need people to go with or something. So that's always um, a good option, kind of network. Photography groups are also really cool because they usually have some pretty awesome pictures. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, looks like we have answered all the questions. So thank you all so much. There will be a survey at the end. Uh, it's very quick, it takes like one minute. Um, but yeah, just let us know how we're doing, any feedback or anything, feel free to share um, anything about uh, tonight's webinar. But thank you all for taking the time out of your night to come out and learn about some of our wildlife. Awesome, thank you, Caitlin, this was awesome. <laughs> all right, have a good night, everybody.